so this talk is an update of a paper that I wrote 30 years ago, which was just called Hints for Computer Systems. We've learned a few things in the last 30 years, so now it can, there are a few principles along with the hints. Um, but the hints, remember, it's still mostly hints, and the hints are only suggestions, so you don't get to nitpick them. If a hint isn't helpful to you in your particular situation, then you should just ignore it. Um, there are a lot of different ways to think about things that are important for building computer systems. And for this talk, I've picked two of them. Um, you can think about it in terms of what the goals of the system are. And of course, I'm not going to talk about the, um, the specific functionality th that you're trying to achieve in your system. Instead, I'm going to talk about more general goals, such as sim making your system simple, timely, efficient, adaptable, dependable. And then someone pointed out to me several years ago, another very important goal in the modern world where computers live in the real world, not just in machine rooms. Uh, in many cases, it's important to make your system yummy so that your customers will really want it. And of course, you know, uh, today, the ma master builders of yummy systems are Apple. But um, there, are, there are many other examples where people have been fairly succe successful making that as a, as a major goal. So the goals, uh, what it is you want to achieve, are one dimension that I want to talk about. And the other dimension is the how, the methods that you might use uh, for achieving these goals. And I've organized those under three headings, uh, approximate, approximate, do things incrementally, and divide and conquer. And so we end up with the slogan, steady by aid, which might be helpful to you in, in remembering what all these things are. So um, goals first, uh, there are six. Uh, you, you might want your system to be simple. You might want it to be timely, that is, get to market before the competition. Uh, you might, it might be important for it to be efficient. Uh, adaptability is often very important. Uh, many systems have to be dependable, and I said a few words about yumminess. And compared with 30 years ago, I think um, three of these six goals are new. They were things that you didn't worry about too much when you were building a computer system 30 years ago. And the other three are the same. And altogether, it adds up to steady. And of course, it's important to bear in mind that uh, you have to dis when you're building a system, you have to decide what's important to you. You're not going to be able to achieve all of these things. Uh, engineering is a matter of making choices and, and making well-judged trade-offs. On the how side, methods for building systems, um, I've organized uh, uh, about three quarters of the things that I know about how to build systems under these three headings. Uh, you do things uh, approximately. You build systems that are good enough, not perfect. You uh, build systems with loose specifications, you use lazy evaluation. Uh, you do things incrementally. You compose big things out of smaller things. Uh, you do things iteratively, one step at a time, and you build systems to be extensible. And third, uh, in the AID acronym, but most important, is divide and con conquer. You um, d design your system with abstractions so that the, the, at any given time, there are views of the system that you can actually understand, and most of the complexity uh, is masked behind the abstractions. And there are other techniques that I'll talk about a little more when we get to there. Uh, before I start in on the details of uh, the, the steady goals and the aid methods, I just want to say a few things that cut across that. One of them is that it's often very helpful to think in terms of of oppositions. Uh, and the most important opposition that I know of is the difference between precise, what I call precise, and what I call approximate software. Precise software is software that actually has a spec, even if the spec is not properly written down. And if the system doesn't meet the spec, the customer will be unhappy. So banking systems and avionics systems and things, Microsoft Office are that. If you drop a single character out of a Word document, or change a sim single number in an Excel spreadsheet, the customer will be unhappy. In, fa in fact, many of you uh, perhaps remember the giant flap that was caused 
w when it turned out that occasionally an Intel Pentium chip would give the wrong answer on, on division. And, and they ended up having to replace half a billion dollars worth of Pentium chips uh, because that was a precise system. Um, approximate software is a very different matter. The important thing is to get it soon and to make it cool. So uh, web search, shopping, Twitter, these are approximate things. Uh, if you get the wrong answer a few percent of the time, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's not that one kind of software is better or worse than the other. The important thing is that they're different. And if, and if your judgment about what kind of software you're building is wrong, then you're going to waste a lot of time and energy, or you're going to have unhappy customers. And so it's very important to understand what kind of system you're building. Another set of oppositions is uh, uh, very, very closely models the, the goals that I sketched out before. There are oppositions among having features, time to market, speed, cost, dependability, and coolness. And I found a way to turn all of these things into words that start with F in English. So there's, there's oppositions among being fancy, first, fast, frugal, faithful, and fun. Uh, and again, it's not that one of these things is necessarily better or worse than another, but you have to think about what kind of trade-offs you're going to make. Uh, is the system correct? Does it run? Will it sell? Can it evolve? Uh, and there are many other oppositions that, that I could you know, talk about. Uh, another important overarching consideration yeah. is the question of coordinate systems and notation. Um, Often, if you choose the right coordinate system, your life is going to be much easier than if you uh, cho choose an inappropriate one. Think of it as being like a uh, center of mass coordinates for uh, simple dynamics problems in physics or eigenvectors for matrices. Um, if, you rot if you rotate the coordinate system so that the axes are, al are lined up along the eigenvectors, then it's much easier to understand what the matrix transformation is doing than if you use a different coordinate system. Uh, my favorite example here is the difference between the system state viewed as being and the system state viewed as becoming. Th that is the difference between the state as the values of a lot of, vari of named variables and the state viewed as the sequence of operations that you did to get from some initial state to where you are now. Um, so it's for example, in the case of a display, it's the difference between the display as a bitmap and the display as a display list that says how to construct the image. Uh, it's uh, redo and undo logs in that are used in database systems are an example of, of um, viewing the state as becoming rather than as being. Uh, and so are replicated state machines that are used for, for uh, building fault tolerant systems. Another example of, of different coordinate systems is the di difference between viewing a function as a piece of code versus viewing it as a table versus viewing it as an overlay of one function, one partial function on another. Uh, closely related to the idea of choosing the right coordinate system is the idea that you should use a good notation that's well suited to your problem. And notation has three aspects. There's vocabulary, the types and methods that, you're, that you um, have at your disposal. There's syntax and domain the success of domain-specific languages is a good example of how um, choosing an appropriate notation for your problem can have a big payoff. And then there's the primitives that you have at your disposal. And the third overarching uh, thing I have to say is uh, if you're building a system, write a spec. Uh, this is extremely unpopular advice for programmers. Programmers hate to write specs. They like to jump in and, and start writing the code. Um, in my experience, I've given the whole story of how you can write spe specs and do correctness proofs on this slide, how much of this story it makes sense to use in your particular uh, system um, depends uh, on how complex the algorithms are and how important it is that your system do the right thing every time. But at least for any, every, just about every system, you should write down the state. You should write down the abstract state of the system. So for example, the abstract state of the file system is it's a map from path names to byte arrays. There's all kinds of implementation complexity underneath that, but that's the abstract state. That's what, that's what the system is doing. And the, 
the next step in understanding what's going on is to write down the interface actions. And then uh, um, I've sketched out how you actually go about doing correctness proofs. But we won't go into that here. But writing down the state al always has a huge payoff. And you can see that people typically don't do it if, for example, uh, you read the typical MSDN documentation for our software, Microsoft software. Um, usually you will search that documentation in vain for a clear understanding of what the state of the system is that's being described. And it makes it very difficult to understand what it is that's actually going on. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the goals and then I'll talk about the methods. Just to remind you, the, the acronym for the goals is STEADY, simple, timely, efficient, adaptable, dependable, and yummy. And I'm not going to talk any more about yummy than I already did, but I will we'll talk about all the others in some detail. So simple, why is it so important for your system to be simple? Well, you sort of all, we all sort of know the answer. It's because we can't do much. Um, computers can generate far mo more complexity than we can deal with very quick quickly. And whenever you're bi building a system, you're struggling against this uh, um, demon of complexity. Being simple is hard, and often it's not rewarded because if you figure out how to do something in a simple way, uh, your colleagues will say, oh, that's obvious. Um, two or three years ago, I was at a conference where there was a session chaired by Tim Berners-Lee on things that perhaps should have been done differently when the web was started. And about a dozen things were proposed during this three-hour session. And Tim himself proposed a couple of them. And my con conclusion, sitting there and listening to it, was that in every single case, Tim had made the right decision by not adopting this feature. Because every single one of those things would have made the system, the web, more complicated, and thus would have made it less li likely that it would actually be adopted. Of course, the web is not simple anymore. Once it's caught on, then it's okay to elaborate it. Um, and the only price you pay for that is horrible security, which is what we have. Um, an it's an interesting question why computer scientists didn't invent the web. And I'm qu quite convinced that the reason for that is that it's too simple. And if Tim had described it in a paper and submitted it to a computer systems conference, it definitely would have been rejected on the grounds that it was wildly ineffi inefficient and didn't have any new ideas in it and all kinds of other spurious reasons. When is it simple enough? Well, it's simple enough when you can still understand it. But then you have to think about what's going to happen as the system evolves. It's going to become more complicated. And pretty soon you won't be able to understand it anymore. And then what? Well, only abstraction and interfaces can save you in that case. Okay, what about timeliness? The basic point here is you have to keep, keep it real. You have to have a good sense of what it is that your customers actually need and, and not over-engineer, not try to build something that is more elaborate than what's really needed. In many cases, you don't actually know what the customers need, and they don't know either. If you look, uh, for the most part, I'm not going to say anything about the quotations at the, bottoms of the bottom of the slides, but, but this one at the very bottom of this slide is really important. The users exclaimed with a laugh and a taunt, it's just what we ask for, but not what we want. The only way you're going to find out whether the user, what the users actually want, want is to give them some things and see what they do. Because the users are not paid to explain to you what they want. They're paid to do their jobs. Um, the most important aspect of timeliness, I think, is that good enough is good enough. Why is the web successful? It's successful because it doesn't have to work. And it doesn't work. Uh, a significant fraction of the time you know, somewhere between 1% and 10% of the time, you click on a link and the wrong thing happens. Um, probably uh, four out of five times, if you click on the link again, the right thing will happen. And one out of five times, um, the wrong, wrong thing will keep happening. And in China, of course, it's worse because you also have the Great Firewall. But, but even if you don't have the Great Firewall, um, th this is just the way the web is. And it's, it's a vital... <gasps> Um, component of its success. Uh, another aspect of this is, even aside from clicking on links, many errors are just not fatal. You can retry, you can undo a mistake, or it just doesn't matter much. Uh, if, if you're a customer for, of Amazon's, for example, and you look at Amazon's web pages uh, w with some care, you will notice that frequently there are mistakes on them. They'll tell you the wrong thing about what it is that 
you looked at recently, or they'll make recommendations that don't make any sense or whatever. Uh, Amazon has optimized for timeliness and yumminess over um, correctness, and that's a good optimization. Efficiency. This is something that people used to obsess about <coughs> in building computer systems, and there was an important reason for that, namely that often it was a big challenge to <coughs> squeeze the, fun the functionality that you wanted to have into the, the hardware that you could afford. Nowadays, there certainly are still cases where, where that aspect of efficiency is extremely important, B but there are many fewer cases that, like that than there ought to be, than there used to be. In a great many cases, um, effic quote, efficient, unquote, use of the hardware is not really that important because uh, you're, you're not, the demands you're putting on the hardware are quite minimal. And so it's important to bear in mind that there are two aspects of efficiency. There's efficiency from the point of view of the implementer, and there's efficiency from the point of view of the client. And of course, they're not unrelated. The client doesn't want to have to spend a lot more money for the computer than it might be necessary, but uh, there are also trade-offs there. Um, another aspect, another, another thing to think about in connection with efficiency is that there are different kinds of efficiency, and it's important to understand which aspects of efficiency are important for you and your customers. If the most important thi thing is the people cost to administer the system, then you have to do standardized and do a lot of automation of uh, system administration. And people have been learning how to do that in the context of cloud computing. This is something, something that used to be very much neglected. Um, if the most important thing is the cost of the hardware that you need to deploy in order to provide a stable service, then you have to write tight code, code and perhaps use clever algorithms. If the most important thing is the non-recurring engi non engineering cost and the time to market, then you should use big off-the-shelf components, um, burn hardware resources, and make sure that you, uh, what you build is just good enough, not perfect. Adaptability. This is another w one of the things th that didn't used to be so important. It used to be that systems were built for a particular purpose. They lived for a fairly limited amount of time, a few year years. During that time, the load on the system didn't change that much, and they kept doing more or less the same thing. That is not today's world. In today's world, um, every aspect of the environment in which the system lives changes a great deal. Successful systems, and successful systems live for a long time. Machine get, machines get faster, the load on the system increases, features get added, and the basic system design has to be able to accommodate, has to be adaptable enough to be able to accommodate all these changes. It, it's um, a very impressive feat of engineering that the internet and the web were able to grow from uh, 100 sites to a billion. Um, I've sketched out some of the most important aspects of adaptability. The most important one probabil probably is being able to do incremental updates because big things by their nature change only a little bit at a time. So it's very important to have extensibility and to have incremental algorithms. Uh, and fault tolerance is, an, is another big aspect of that. And finally, um, there's dependability. System is dependable if you don't have to say, I'm sorry. And of course, classically, dependability has three aspects. You want your system to be reliable, that is, you want it to give the right answer. You want it to be available, that is, you want it to give the answer promptly, not next week. And you want it to be secure, which is that it works <coughs> in spite of the fact that there are adversaries trying to keep it from working. The most difficult aspect of dependability, I think, we know how to build arbitrarily dependable systems. That not, not trivial, but relatively modest, modest costs. The question is, how much do you want to pay? How much dependability do you need? And that's a, a something that more dependability is not necessarily better. Um, a few years ago, the British ra Railways had a couple of crashes in which people were killed. And after that, they put, put in place a big safety program. And it's been estimated th that the c cost of, it, of that program per life saved has been, been on the 
order of a billion dollars. And it seems pretty clear that that's not a sensible way to spend your money because there are many ways to save lives by spending much less than a billion dollars per, per life saved. And that was done for <coughs> political and public relations reasons, but from any, any sort of rational economic analysis, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, the US phone system used to be much more dependable than it is now. Uh, in, fa in fact, it used to be much more dependable than the market demanded. And the reason for that was that the US phone system used to be owned by a single company, and that co company uh, was regulated by the government and the basis of the regulation was that they could earn a certain percentage on the capital that they had invested. So from their point of view, investing more capital is better, uh, up to the limit where you can no longer persuade the regulators that it makes any sense. So they built a phone system that was far, far more de dependable than any customer demand. But they didn't have to worry about that, that since the customers didn't have it anywhere. There was no alternative for the customers. They couldn't go to a different supplier and pay less and get a less dependable system. And the advent of cell phones, of course, has completely changed that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that was, that was the steady part. That was the goals. Now we'll talk about the how part. How, how, do you, how can you achieve these goals? And I've organized these, un, as I said before, under three categories. Approximate, approximate incremental, and divide and conquer. And divide and conquer is by far the most important of those. I lo looked very hard for an acronym that began with D, but I could not find one. So divide and conquer has a, num there num uh, has a number of aspects. You can do the division in, in many different ways. And the most important aspect is abstraction and interfaces. Uh, uh, and the way to think about this in this context is this is dividing by di different in the different parts of the system. And the basic motivation for this is to limit the complexity and li liberate the parts so that each one can evolve yeah. independently of the others. The, the classic examples of this from computer systems in the la last uh, 30 years have been uh, the TCP IP protocol that underlies the internet, um, the design of file systems for operating systems, and the design of the HTML uh, web uh, data representation. And each of these has had the property that because the interface is well defined, is carefully designed, well defined, and changes very slowly, uh, it's possible for, for uh, a w wide range of different users of this interface to evolve independently of a wide range of different implementations of the interface. So there are dozens of diff different ways to implement TCP IP um, using uh, physical network mechanisms and overlay networks and all kinds of things like that. There are dozens of ways to implement the me mechanics of the file sy system, all of which are compatible with the, the hundreds of thousands of applications that have been written to use the file system, and similarly with HTML. Another important aspect of, of uh, abstraction that I, I didn't understand for a long time is the difference between abstraction and platforms, or layers, if you like. And what a, plat platfor what a platform is, it's a collection of a whole bunch of abstractions yeah. together into a single thing, the most important property of which is that you can ship it as a single unit. Why is this important? Because, yeah, because it makes it much easier for the custo customers to understand what they're depending on. If a customer uses, think about it, a customer of an operating system like, like Windows or the Mac OS. Um, you depend on dozens of different components of the system. There's the display system, the networking, the file system, so on and so forth. Um, if you have to think separately uh, about which version of each one of those things you're depending on, you'll lose your mind. Uh, <coughs> the job of the platform is to pa pack, it, pack it, all that complexity into a something you, that you can call Windows 8.1. And then, then you, you, you can just test your application against Windows 8.1. And, and that's just absolutely critical. Uh, another aspect of platforms that's pretty important is the uh, platform as a general purpose simplifier. So for example, if you choose Java or C Sharp as your platform, uh, then you get garbage collection, automatic memory management uh, for free. 
of course, there's some cost associated with that. But as a user of that platform, you don't have to think about it. All the complexity associated with memory management, or almost all the complexity associated with memory management, it's taken care of automatically by the platform. Uh, a, a related issue is um, doing things declaratively as opposed to writing a progr program that, that does things one step at a time. Uh, four or five years ago, I was asked to write a chapter for a fest shrift in honor of Alan Kay's 70th birthday. And uh, I agreed to write a chapter on declarative programming. When it came time to actually write it, I realized that I didn't really know what declarative programming is. So I went and searched the net and found a whole bunch of references to declarative pro programming that didn't seem to have that much in common. And I scratched my head for a while, and finally I, f I decided that a program is declarative if it doesn't have very many steps. So for example, that means that it cannot have a loop, because a loop has a lot of steps. Um, and why is this good? It's good because it's easier to understand what's going on if, if there's only a few steps. People are not very good at following out the consequences of lots of steps. So HT HTML and XML are, are an example of doing things declaratively. So are SQL queries. So are schemas of databases. Um, and I'm, we won't talk about synthesis. So that was uh, abstract by, that was the <laughs> divide by difference, abstraction. There's other ways to do division. Uh, you can divide by structure, that's called recursion. And the basic idea of recursion is that the part is very similar to the whole. So you know, I have quick sort, we have distributed hash tables, we have path names and file systems, we have IP, IPv6, um, all kinds of things where you, you have some idea that you can apply repeated, uh, repeatedly at different levels of, of complexity. Um, you can divide for redundancy, that's called replication. And you can do that either in time or in space. And this is the essential tool that we use to make systems that are reliable, in spite of the fact that the co co components can't be counted on to work all the time. So if you retry in time, uh, that's retransmission. Uh, you do some sort of end-to-end -end check, and you repeat, repeat the operation if it doesn't work out. And the canonical uh, example that we have of that in today's world is, is TCP. Uh, if you divide in space so that you can deal with the complete failure of some component, you do, you do that with a technique called replicated state machines. The essential idea is the same. You're going to do the operation repeatedly, uh, and you're going to have some mechanism for picking out uh, uh, which repetitions uh, gave the desired result and which ones should be discarded. And finally, you can divide for performance. That's called concurrency. And uh, in the modern world, of course, that's become extremely important for two reasons. One is that with the advent of the web and of cloud computing, uh, demands for extremely high performance have increased enormously. In extremely high total performance have increased enormously. And the second one is that it's no, no longer the case that each generation of computers executes a single stream of instructions two or three times faster than the previous generation. Nowadays, typically, it doesn't execute a single stream of instructions much faster at all. But it is willing to execute lots more streams in parallel. So my slogan for concurrency is, um, here, it's known that programming for concurrency is hard. Uh, there's two ways to make it easy. One is called striping or data parallel computing, where you do the sa <laughs> essentially the same thing indep independently on a whole bu bunch of different pieces of data that don't interact with each other. And the other is streaming, where you arrange things in a pipeline and you pour the data through. And if you can't figure out, and, and the canonical example of that is, is MapReduce. Uh, if you can't figure out how to either stripe or stream, then you're going to struggle. Uh, you're going to have difficulty writing the program so that it's both concurrent and correct. So that was uh, divide and conquer. And we have two other aspects of uh, methods. Incremental is the next most important one after divide and con conquer. Um, and there's sev several subsidiary uh, 
i's that make a, a large part of incremental. Um, I've, at the top of this slide I, of incremental, I've put composition. You can compose relations, functions, processes, components uh, to make bigger, bigger things out of smaller ones. And this is a fundamental technique that you use uh, for building large systems. Uh, and one of the interesting things I think that's been happening in computing in the last few years, uh, the idea that you, you could have lots of co components that you build your system out of is a very old one. It dates back to a, su a suggestion from Doug McElroy in, at the 1968 Software Engineering Conference. Um, and to first approximation, for many years, it didn't work. Um, people tried to make software components, and then they tried to put uh, those components together to make systems, and it didn't work very well for a variety of reasons, basically having to do with the fact that uh, engineering, uh, something is really a component in, in the sense that it can be reused in a number of different contexts is pretty hard, and people didn't want to pay for it. So the only components that existed for quite a long time were very big components, operating system, browser, database system, which have the property that they're so big and have so much functionali functionality and so much input into them that as a customer, even if you're a, even if you're only using 1% of the functionality of the database system, it's still much better than rolling your own. And B, you use very few of them, so you can afford to deal with, with the fact that it takes quite a long time to learn how to use each one effectively. But one of the things that's been happening more recently, I think, is that we are starting to have big components besides those, those three. Um, so for example, um, this isn't, this is only barely true today if it is true, but we're pretty close to the point where a computer vision system or a speech recognition system can actually be a component as opposed to a PhD thesis. Um, and that means that you can build, start, start building very interesting systems out of these big components, which didn't used to be possible. It used to be the case, that, for, uh, for example, that a computer vision system that did anything interesting had the property that it was somebody's PhD thesis <laughs> And it was very unlikely that anyone other than the per person who built it could actually use it successfully. Uh, and increasingly, that's not tr true. Yeah. And if you're interested in <laughs> building big systems that have a lot of function, now that I think yeah, this is the very important thing to think about. Um, the, the most imp important single uh, application of the idea of composition, though, I is indirection. And the idea behind indirection is that you control the name to value mapping somehow. And that allows you to virtualize things, virtual machines or NAT or USB or app compatibility. Uh, it allows you to do networking um, where you can go from source writing to IP addresses to DNS names to services to individual queries. Um, it allows you to have symbolic links, register renaming, virtual methods, copy on write, an enormous range of techniques. Neeks can be thought of uh, under the general rubric of, of indirection. In fact, um, David Wheeler said many, many years ago, any problem in computer science can be solved by another level of indirection. And this is a quotation which has been unfairly attributed to me by many people, but actually, actually was said by David Wheeler. Um, related to these thoughts is the idea that you can iterate you can iterate design, you can iterate actions, you can iterate components. So there's redo logs and replicated state machines, there's undo, uh, and there's scaling that you get by making lots of co co copies of essentially the same thing. <laughs> Finally, there's the A of aid, which is a, uh, approximate. The most important of this aspect of this is one that we've already talked about uh, several times, which is the notion of things being good enough. Web, the web, search engines, IP packets, you shouldn't work too hard. Um, you, should just, you should make sure that the thing is good enough for whatever it's going to be used for. In the original design of the ARPANET, uh, very few people remember this, but in the original design of the ARPANET, the network made a promise that if it accepted your packet, um, it would deliver it at the other end, <laughs> assuming that the other end is still there. Um, 
regardless of anything that might happen inside the ne network, short of total catastrophe. And this decision turned out to have a, a huge number of uh, unanticipated consequences. Uh, and after about five years, they had to, uh, to reverse this decision and adopt the best effort stra strategy that the internet has, has had from the beginning, which is that when you put a packet I in, uh, the network will try to get it delivered, but it d definitely doesn't give you any guarantee. Uh, and if you want to guarantee that the packet's going to be delivered, you have to be prepared to retransmit it maybe, maybe in, uh, several times. And there are many, many aspects of this good enough uh, principle. Um, uh, other ways that you can um, take a advantage of the idea of approximation, uh, loose coupling is very important. Build your system out of springy, flaky parts. Um, so springy means that they're adaptable to bad things that happen around them. Flaky means that it's okay if they do some bad things. Uh, a very f familiar example of this is email. Um, the, the, the email system as a whole, whole is uh, very, uh, it's pretty good at, at delivering the email message from the sender to the receiver, in spite of the fact that many, many of the pieces, many of the, the, the uh, components through which the message has, has to pass at, at many different le levels of abstraction are pretty unreliable. But the system as a whole is en engineered so that it overcomes all those problems. Uh, brute force is always good. Um, we have not had very good luck in computer systems at making optimal use of the resource at, at our disposal. Uh, Over-provisioning is usually better. Hardware is not that expensive. You can afford to over-provision. Broadcasting is good. Scanning through all the data uh, rather than, uh, than trying to index it so that, uh, so that you can zero in on exactly what you need uh, is very often the best way to do business. Um, if you, uh, if your system is not behaving well, often a good strategy is to reboot it. These are all, all aspects of using brute force. Uh, relaxation uh, is another um, pretty different um, aspect of, of doing things approximately. The I basic idea there is you take small steps that you hope will converge to the desired result. So routing protocols, da daily builds in software construction, Exponential backoff in, in TCP and in the Ethernet are all exam examples of uh, applying the idea of relaxation. And I'll skip over the rest of them. So just to summarize all of this, um, I've talked about hints for system design and a few principles, not too many. The hints are just suggestions. And I organized the, the hints under two headings, uh, the goals that you have uh, 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 for your system. You'd like it to be simply. You'd like it to simple. You'd like it to be timely. You'd like it to be efficient, adaptable, dependable, and yummy. Um, and how are you going to go about achieving these goals? Well, you, you can't. Uh, um, I don't know how, how how to put everything that I know about how 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 to build systems under these three headings. But probably 70 or 80 percent of what I know. Uh, fits under these headings of approximate, incremental, and divide and conquer. Well, that was a lot of things I told you about. If you only remember three of them, here are the three to remember. Keep it simple, abstract with c clean interfaces, and write a spec. And just one last hint. None of these things are a substitute for getting it right. And on that note, I think I'll stop. And... <laughs>